It has always been a dream of mine to own a large collection of books and to have a large TBR of possibilities to pull from. But while I love having a lot of books, I currently don't want to add any more bookshelves into my home, which means that these types of books that I currently have on the floor are a problem. So I somehow need to get all of these books from the floor onto my shelves, which are currently at capacity, which is where this series comes in. Throughout 2024, I'm going to be stuffing these stacks onto my shelves through any means possible. At the beginning of every episode, I will use a random number generator to select books that have to make their way to my shelves or my unhaul pile by the end of the vlog. The easiest way to start may be to read them, but if I then decide that I want to keep them, I will need to choose another book from my shelves to either read or unhaul. The episode will end when the original books chosen from the stacks and all subsequent ones pulled from shelves have made their way to either their new home on a shelf or into my unhaul pile. The stacks may change throughout the year as I organically read, unhaul and rearrange my shelves. The pool of books to choose from may change slightly as things get moved around my library or the pile could shrink with a big unhaul or even grow if I buy too many books but the overall goal remains the same by the end of 2024 the stacks have to go in episode 5 we scrapped five books and we managed to shelve one and we will be starting episode 6 with 68 books in the stacks <laughs> Hello my guys, welcome to Shelf It or Scrap It episode 6. As usual, if you are new to this series, I will link the playlist down in the description box in case you guys need to catch up. But essentially the main goal of this video series is to get all of these books that are stacked behind me on to my shelves through any means possible. So we are going to be starting episode six with 68 books, which I think is three less than we started episode five on. I have added a small amount, I think just three books to the stacks from my May unboxing. Now this is going to be just like a regular old standard episode. So we're going to be using the random number generator. I'm quite excited about this one actually, because I've been feeling, I don't know if I am feeling slumpy, like I'm feeling the desire to read, but when I'm sitting down and I'm picking up a book, I'm just not really getting into it. So I'm hoping that the spontaneous nature of Shelf It or Scrap It is kind of going to get me a little bit more excited about reading again. Because like I said, I want to read, I'm trying to read but I just don't feel like I'm getting anywhere like this is not the first week of the month or no it is it is actually that's a lie <laughs> we're a few days into the month now and I haven't really made any significant progress in anything so let's get up my random number generator and our max is 68 let's generate a few because you know how I be and let's get into our first book of episode six number 47 interesting 47 so 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 contemporary romance so book number 47 is Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Herring Blake. Now I have read and really enjoyed an Ashley Herring Blake book before, which is Girl Made a Star. Sorry, I couldn't see it for if I'm on Stara. And I've also read Ashley Herring Blake's middle grade book, which I thought was okay. I do like to read middle grade occasionally, but specifically middle grade fantasy and that one being a contemporary just didn't hit with me, although I feel like it would of course be more successful with its target demographic. So I know Ashley Herring Blake for hard hitting contemporary stories. I have never read a romance from Ashley Herring Blake before, so I'm interested to see how this one plays out. I know it is like a very well loved sapphic romance and we are following Delilah Green, who I think is a photographer or is the love interest of photographer. Delilah is the photographer and her estranged stepsister pressures her into being the photographer for her wedding and she ends up back in her hometown which she absolutely never wanted to do where she ends up reluctantly growing closer to her stepsister's stuck up best friend who is a single mother and I'm assuming they have some sort of history where they didn't like each other but they're gonna grow closer over the course of this book. So I feel like as I said I am feeling a little bit slumpy. A contemporary romance is a pretty good show. It does look like a little bit of a long one it's 371 pages so pushing it a little bit for me because I do prefer my like 
my limit for a contemporary romance is 400 pages if it's over that i'm like why though like why do we need to be longer than 400 pages so it is within those bounds but it is also a little bit of a longer one but hopefully this is just what i need to kind of get me a region again so today the weather is miserable like it's raining it's gray you would not think that we're supposed to be in the middle of summer and i'm also not feeling my best like i'm feeling okay but i felt better so i'm having a little bit of a duvet day with brie and i'm pretty much just pottering around a little bit getting some stuff done and also hoping to get some reading done so hopefully i'll be able to get through a little chunk of this one today so i did spend most of yesterday just kind of vibing minding my own business i watched england win the quarterfinals of the euros and like one of the most boring <laughs> games of football i've ever watched for like an international tournament and i also watched a movie what did we watch we watched the family affair with zach efron and nicole kidman which was all right like it was it was decent it was exactly kind of what i wanted like just a chill good time that i didn't have to think too hard about and i'll probably never watch it again but then alongside all of that i have also read quite a lot of delilah green doesn't care and like i said i wasn't feeling my best yesterday so i didn't really want to come in and like do updates and stuff i was just minding my own business truly but i'm now 196 pages into this so i'm past the halfway point and there's a good chance that i could actually finish this today because it is still the weekend i'm actually also enjoying this a little bit more than i expected to because i was not necessarily in the mood for romance and i think it's been a while since i've read like a, a very well written kind of contemporary romance which i feel like this definitely is and while the romance is very slow it almost i wouldn't say it blossoms into a friendship because the chemistry and the romantic intentions and feelings are definitely there from the very beginning but the focus of the book is actually not the romantic relationship between those two and i feel like that is why i'm actually enjoying this so much and i sadly really do relate to delilah as a character and i'm really enjoying this book for that although i gotta say yesterday especially because my mood wasn't great i was finding it a little bit triggering in those elements nothing like super dramatic i was just it was just making me kind of sad you know <laughs> so to flesh the plot of this one out a little bit we're following delilah who is from this small town which i think is over it's like three hours away from seattle i think they said so it's like over in the west of the u.s and delilah when she turned 18 like straight after graduation she moved to new york and she's actually only been to her hometown twice but because she lives in new york she obviously not necessarily struggles but she's working multiple jobs to be able to pay rent and her wicked wicked stepmother gets in touch and essentially offers her a lot of money to be the photographer for her stepsister's wedding so she not in a position to refuse a large sum of money for like two weeks of work does agree to doing this and she flies over to her hometown where immediately she meets one of her stepsister's best friends who is the love interest claire and Claire does not recognize her. So Delilah is attracted to her. So they flirt a little bit with Delilah knowing full well who Claire is until Claire realizes who she is flirting with. Now, the background of Delilah is kind of what's so sad and also the situation that she's put in at this wedding because when she was very, very young, when she was a toddler, her mother died. When she was a little bit older, her dad remarried he married this woman isabel and a couple of years after that he died now her stepmother went into kind of a period of deep depression and grief because she had also already lost her husband to cancer before her new husband delilah's father died and when she came out of it delilah was kind of waiting for isabel to step into this motherly role that never really happened and all delilah could see from this kind of like position where she was borderline neglected was how fixated her stepmother was on her stepsister's success like constantly pushing her to strive for her goals to achieve to excel and delilah was fed she was clothed but she was she wasn't bothered with aside from that so that is the reason why she left and she's never come back and she does very much hold a grudge against these people for the way that they treated her when she was a kid and her stepsister and her friends also were very nice to her because she was like kind of a bit of an awkward misfit while her stepsister is this like rich polished kind of almost high society woman so it's really upsetting to see delilah kind of go back to this town where she has been pushed into the role of being staff essentially there are moments where it's very clear that she's only being included because she's this good woman's stepsister but also because she's been paid to photograph the event like they do not want her there she is there for the sake of 
taking pictures of the wedding and those moments when she's excluded moments that she's forgotten about moments where people kind of realize who she is and they're like oh my god because she knows that people have been talking about her saying horrible things about her behind her back and it's just it's difficult to read from the perspective of somebody who has been through grief and then has had to deal with difficult family situations after that very different circumstances but essentially everyone just kind of grieves in their own way and the way that two people grieve does not always go together and it causes a lot of friction which is like my own personal experience I'm not saying that Delilah is entirely blameless in this because I feel like it's very clear that her stepsister is not this ice cold bitch that Delilah has painted her out to be. They are very different people, but I feel like Astrid, who is a main character in one of the books later, in this series. She feels betrayed by Delilah the same way that Delilah feels betrayed by Astrid in that Astrid was smothered by her mother and she didn't have any freedom. She was constantly being monitored whereas Delilah had the opposite kind of problem and I feel like they both feel betrayed by each other where they could have banded together as sisters. They actually ended up hating each other instead. So I'm actually really more wrapped up in the contemporary like familial issues that are going on here and I like I said I do truly feel for Delilah and I'm like very much like firmly on her side. It's also just really sad because she paints this picture of being quite lonely never really having people that she can trust or care about which is why she has these commitment issues and it's getting to me a little bit I can't lie. So I'm really enjoying it because of that. In terms of the romance like I feel like it is decently written like I am enjoying once again I am enjoying these two women coming together but because of the contemporary issues that they face because we don't just follow Delilah in here actually. I should probably talk about Claire because she does have a perspective and she got pregnant right out of high school with her high school sweetheart and now she has an 11 year old. The husband of her child left but he keeps kind of coming back, being unreliable, leaving again, destroying her daughter's kind of emotions and at this point the father has come back and he's not a bad guy, he's just not especially reliable and he said that like this time he's changed and he won't leave again, he's not that person anymore and our main character Claire is like really really struggling to believe him but also she doesn't trust him with her kid like he doesn't reinforce bedtimes he's like the fun parent and she's really struggling trying to make him see the importance of routine and structure but also not wanting to be this horrible like strict parent that her daughter resents and I do feel like she is a little bit too on it like she's a little bit too highly strong and she needs to relax a bit but I also very much understand the place that she's coming from with this man who hasn't been around for the last 11 years because when times get tough he just runs out the door and he wants to come back and kind of like say that he wants a more permanent role in his child's life but also not creating any boundaries or like reinforcing any rules. So definitely on the contemporary side of this I'm really enjoying it which is to be fair expected because I've read Ashley Heron Blake's contemporary fiction before and really enjoyed it but I also do think it's really good to read it in like an adult setting as opposed to YA or middle grade and yeah I'm definitely more invested in this than I thought that I was going to be so it's looking at the minute like this could be a shelf it could very much go either way though I guess it really depends how I feel once I finish this because on the one hand I could like really love it but not care enough to like kind of reread it be like that was a really good story but like I'm done with it or I could decide that I really enjoyed it and I want to keep it forever so we'll have to wait for me to read the next like 180 pages to see which way I fall. I am out in the garden with my book. It is a Monday and my original plan today was to do some editing to get last week's vlog edited because it's the only video that I haven't already edited and scheduled for this week but Monday is honestly the only day of the week where there is quiet outside. <laughs> so it's the only day of the week that like none of my neighbours are home I think potentially Tuesday as well so I was like you know what it's a beautiful day. I never get to sit in my garden when it's quiet. So that's what I'm gonna do. I think I am gonna bob in and do a little bit of editing now and then um, just to mix it up a little bit. But I'm currently 238 pages into Delilah Green Doesn't Care. So I guess my goal for today, well, actually my goal for today is definitely to finish this. But if I could finish it like pretty soonish this afternoon, that would be great. I am still really enjoying it, but I'm definitely more invested in those contemporary issues than I am the romantic relationship and actually I should probably tell you because I, I didn't last time the actual purpose of this book the actual plot is that nobody like Astrid's friends 
and Delilah don't like the guy that she's gonna marry and Delilah doesn't really care who her stepsister marries. Her friends are obviously concerned for her but Delilah just wants to cause her sister a bit of um, emotional turmoil so they end up teaming up to try and ruin this wedding or not ruin the wedding but get Astrid to see that her fiance is a douche canoe. Brie what are you doing? She's just I don't know what she's doing. I think she's just found a piece of bamboo from somewhere, but she really had to rip it up <laughs> to get to it. Um, but yeah, they're trying to make Astrid see that her fiance is a douche canoe before she ends up marrying him. So that's the part that I'm most invested in. The romance is kind of secondary to me, but I am still having a good time with the book. not early afternoon it is 5 p.m and i need to start working on dinner but i have finished delilah green it doesn't care by ashley harry blake a little bit later than anticipated because i made the right decision i got a couple of hours of editing in throughout the day as well as spending most of my time in the garden reading honestly the weather wasn't as nice as i thought that it was it's like 18 degrees so it's not super warm and also it kept going cloudy like it was very intermittently cloudy so i kept coming in editing for a little bit going back out reading for a bit and so on and so forth but anyway the book i gave it three stars there are elements that i really liked about this oops <laughs> elements that I just didn't care about as much sadly so as you know like I talked about it in detail that there are big portions of this book and themes of this book that really resonated with me and those were definitely the most interesting aspects of this story for me. I was very much invested in kind of like the family dynamics between Delilah and Astrid and kind of the background of Claire, the backgrounds of Delilah, the reason why Delilah didn't want to come to this town, the struggle that Claire was having with her ex and also wanting to move on but like struggling to date because she has a kid and she's in a small town and all of those elements I really enjoyed. So the contemporary fiction aspects I loved. The romance it was fine, it was enjoyable but I wasn't, that wasn't the driving force me in this I was more invested in the plot so I guess when I read contemporary fiction I like it to be very hard-hitting like poignant and gritty and this definitely de dealt with some big things but the driving force of the story was a romance and so for that I gave it a three as opposed to a four I felt in the second half that I was getting quite bored and while there were like big standout moments that were jumping out at me and I was really loving I also to some degree like was ready for this book to be over and was kind of losing in interest because I don't read contemporary fiction very often because I can find it quite boring if it's more like slice of life or focusing on like mundane things. That's why I like my contemporary fiction to have something like really interesting or dramatic to anchor the story and because the driving force of this was a romance it wasn't that and that resulted in my three star rating if that makes any sense. I was very pleasantly surprised by this though because I didn't really have any opinion on this book like I wasn't excited to read it I wasn't dreading it it was kind of just a book that I had that I wanted to read at some point I am actually glad that I spent the time like I took the time to read this one it's not that I enjoyed it more than I expected it to it's that the substance of this book was not what I expected it to be I expected it to be focused much more on the romance without all of this other stuff going on in the background which is what I actually really enjoyed about this story so sadly as it is a three star read and while I enjoyed it I'm like not overly invested in it. This one is going to be a scrap. I will say though that this is the first book in a trilogy. It's called, is it the Bright Falls trilogy? I think is the town that they live in. Yeah, so each book follows a member of the friendship group. So it's Claire, Astrid and Iris. I would be tempted to pick up the other books in this series at some point in the future. It's not a massive priority, but I enjoyed this enough that that is a possibility and I have checked and even though they don't have book one at my library they have books two and three so that is definitely something that is available to me. So as we are going to be scrapping this one let's head over to the stacks and see what book number two for this video is going to be. I haven't recounted to make sure but if memory serves me correctly which let's be honest does it ever I think we're on 67 books in the stacks right now so book number two is gonna be 
Number 64, so if we do indeed have 67 in the stacks, we'll just count from the bottom. I'm scared. I feel like it's gonna be another contemporary romance, like an afterlight book or something. But right, so this is the bottom. So 67, 66, 65, 64. Oh no, oh no. It is indeed another contemporary romance and one that I have been worried about for quite some time and that is Lothar and the Millionaires by Catherine Moon. So Aaron sent this to me because she said it's grade A reverse harem smut and that if there's any kind of reverse harem smut that I'm going to enjoy it's going to be this and I know that this is generally well loved by people who love grade A reverse harem smut. Um, sadly like since Aaron sent me this I think when she sent it to me I'd maybe read one reverse harem book and it was a novella and I was kind of like unsure about whether this was going to be something for me and at this point like I'm pretty sure it isn't. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Reverse Harem is not for me and then this is also Omegaverse which I have not read an Omegaverse book before but I did have a little glimpse like a little peek behind that curtain in the very first episode of Shelve It or Scrap It which was an alien romance and that was my first time experiencing Not In. It very quickly scared me away. <laughs> And so I actually don't think that Omegaverse is going to be for me either. So this is going to be an adventure. I'm going to go into it with a somewhat open mind. I think that if I messaged Aaron right now and said, do you still think I'm going to enjoy this? That she would say that it's a no. <laughs> so we'll see. I don't know what the plot is. She's beta which means something in the world of Omega that, that I don't understand. She is sick of being treated badly by alphas and she stumbles upon an alluring pack of captivating men. They are a pack of alphas and apparently they already have an Omega, which I also don't quite understand. I don't even know if this is like a good introduction to Omegaverse. Regardless, I don't think that matters too much because I don't think Omegaverse and Reverse Harem is for me. But yeah, I'll, um, I imagine I'll be back quite soon. That is, in my gut, I feel like I'm gonna be back quite soon to tell you some things about this book. I want you all to know that I took this very, very seriously. I took trying to read this book very, very seriously, but I am gonna be DNFing Lola and the Millionaires. A whole 17 pages in and it's not so much the book because actually the 17 pages that I read for a smutty romance I actually thought were decently well written like we're establishing Lola as a character we're setting up the I mean I can't say much about it guys I read 17 pages but the writing was not bad the the quality of this book is not why I'm DNFing it I personally just cannot read an Omega verse book I just can't do it and I want to be very very clear that I'm not kink shaming here I will never ever kink shame on my channel and by me saying that I don't like something is not to shame anybody who does like that particular thing. Omegaverse is not for me, it does not do it for me, it does the opposite of doing it for me and because of that I just don't see the point in me reading this book because I don't see, even if it was a great book, the fact that it's an Omegaverse would just make me not like it. As we discussed at the beginning like when I picked this book I didn't know specifically what Omegaverse was. I only really know the basics. But right at the beginning of this, something that's really cool is that Catherine Moon has written like a little guide, which is a note on the Omegaverse. So some Omegaverses contain shifters because the concept of Omegaverse comes from like wolf packs and that type of dynamic. So this in particular is not shifters. It's actually something that I didn't really think about until now is that Omegaverse is like sci-fi romance because it is like this one in particular is set in an alternate universe with an alternate human biology that includes animalistic traits adapted to a romance premise. There are fancy penises, mating instincts, pheromones and bonding marks as well as a slight hierarchical social construct. Now as we've discussed recently over the last, I want to say is it the last year after having like a paranormal romance phase back when I was like I don't know how old would I have been when that was all like anyone was publishing? It was the Twilight day. So I read Twilight when I was 13, which was the year it was released. So probably between me being like 13 and 18, big paranormal phase. Since then, since I've 
gone back and like dipped into paranormal romance a little bit in the last couple of years through exploring like fantasy romance discovering that I actually don't like paranormal romance very much I've discovered that I don't like wolves wolves in general like wolf shifter romances creep me out a little bit because I don't like the wolfy dynamic and Omegaverse is pretty much based on the wolfy dynamic which is why I don't like it there's also something that ties into why I don't like wolves and I'm not a massive fan of shifter romances in general it's the animalistic nature of it tied with like humans and then sex that I also don't really love about it so um that's essentially why I don't like Omegaverse and why I just know that I'm just not going to enjoy this book sadly and like I said that is not a criticism on anybody who does like Omegaverse I just kind of want to be clear on why I don't enjoy it because like, I'm DNF and this not based on the book it's just solely based on the fact that I know what Omegaverse is now and I know that it's not something that I'm interested in reading at all. I do also want to say if anybody does think that this sounds interesting that this has themes of sexual assault in it. It does say in the note at the beginning that the story deals with themes of the aftermath of sexual abuse and emotional trauma so do be wary of that if you're going into this. Now I have texted Aaron because I know that Aaron really likes this book and she gifted it to me because of that and I said Aaron like can you find it in your heart to forgive me because now she thinks that I hate her but to be fair Aaron always thinks that I hate her so she said that she will forgive me on one condition. So we are going to be picking book three for this episode a little bit differently because Aaron has been begging me to read The Vanished Words by Simon Jimenez for the longest time. It is in the stacks because Aaron made me put it in the stacks. So now I'm going to read this. I'm doing this for you girl. If you don't know who Aaron is as well, she does have a booktube channel. I'll link her below if you want to go check her out. She is, she's the best honestly, <laughs> but there is a story behind this actually. I went to New York last year for my birthday and Aaron lives like not far away. She lives in Washington. So she came down, like I did a bookish meetup and we went to Barnes and Noble and she was determined for me to to read this book she was like you're gonna love this book you're gonna give this book five stars I just know that you're gonna love it so she searches everywhere around Barnes and Noble on Union Square for this book and she can't find it so she gets somebody who works at Barnes and Noble to go all the way up to like the top floor it's like four or five stories I think the Union Square one and bring this book all the way down and then she hands it to me and I'm like okay right well I have to buy it now because you've made this poor person go up and down all of these stairs for this book and then I find out when I get home after I bought this book in New York a couple of weeks later that Aaron hasn't even read this book. This book that she's so convinced I'm going to give five stars she has not even read and since then she has actually read it and she gave it like three stars so I don't know why she's so desperate for me to read this. She's still convinced that I'm going to love it I guess but she made me put it in the stacks off the shelf so that there would be more chance of me reading it and she's desperate to find out what I think so like if I DNF this I don't think she's ever going to talk to me again which it, it's not an ideal <laughs> an ideal outcome if I'm being honest. So this one, all I know about it is that it is a sci-fi. It is somewhat of a space opera. I have heard it described as a space opera, but not in a traditional sense. And I know that it involves space travel in some way. I have heard it compared to the Becky Chambers books, the Long Way to a Small Angry Planet kind of books, which I gave some of those five stars. I think maybe one and two, and then I gave three and four four stars. So that is a series that I really love. I always say I really Really love sci-fi but I just don't tend to read a lot of it and this follows multiple perspectives I think at multiple points through time. The synopsis is very ambiguous and I believe it's quite a lyrical almost literary story so I don't know like what the exact deal is. This is one that is very hype to me. It's on my Our Fantasy Bingo TBR so I am expecting really good things but I honestly guys I am the most trusting gullible person and it is one of my fatal flaws because <laughs> side tangent just the fact that I am so gullible and trusting causes me to be disappointed by people <laughs> like so many times like when people say like yeah like I'm gonna do this thing for you and I rely on them like actually doing that thing and then they turn out not to and it's honestly like one of my worst character flaws how kind of trusting I am but to, to like make it much less dramatic and bring it back to this book I only think so highly of this book because Aaron told me I'm gonna love it what if Aaron's wrong you know <laughs> what if Aaron's wrong because that's literally all I'm going on I have heard really good things about Simon Jimenez's other book though which is the Spear 
put through water and actually it would be really good if I did enjoy this because I am going to San Diego at the end of the month and I didn't want to pick up I'm sure it's called The Spear Cuts Through Water. I'll show you a picture here. I didn't want to pick up this book until I'd read this book. So if I love this book, then maybe this is the book that I can pick up in San Diego because I do like to get at least one book from every place that I visit as like the book that I bought on this holiday. So um, yeah, if I like this, then The Spear That Cuts Through Water can be that. But also actually thinking about it, I'm going to pick up the latest volume of Laura Olympus in the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition. So maybe I'll end up with two souvenir books. But I've been talking a long time about nothing in particular. The long and short of the matter is Lola and the Millionaires is scrapped. And to beg for Aaron's forgiveness, I'm going to read The Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez. Let me tell you guys, I am glad that I chose yesterday to read in the sun because this is the weather today. She is wet and it's supposed to be like this literally the entire day. So I've been thinking about some stuff, some stuff and some things. I have been editing this vlog up to date and based on what we said about Lola and the millionaires yesterday, I have decided that I'm gonna do some pruning of the stacks. Essentially, like I am tired. I know you guys are probably tired. I am tired myself of saying over and over again, I don't like reverse harem. And you know what would stop me from saying that? if I just removed all of the reverse harem that I own and then I don't have to read reverse harem again. You guys don't have to keep hearing me say about how much I don't like one of your favorite romance tropes. And I don't have to read reverse harem again because I feel weird about it, I do. Because I always kind of want to give everything a chance. Like if you forget about everything else and think about exclusively this challenge, we have had a five star read in Crimson Moth, which was one that I know a ton of other people were really enjoying, but because it was, I'm pretty sure it was a YA fairy loot book. I was like, I just don't think this is gonna be for me. If we think about Babel, which I read in the last episode, which I actively did not want to read. Like I would have, if I'd have had my choice, if there wasn't a part of me that always wants to give everything a try, I would have unhauled Babel immediately. And it could be, like it's definitely one of my favorite books of last month. So I'd like to give everything a chance. But now that we're getting to the point, cause these books that I have, I have them from a time when I was getting into fantasy romance and romance in general, like as an adult. Cause when I was a teenager, I pretty much exclusively read contemporary romance. But as an adult, I was getting back into romance again, first through fantasy romance and then into contemporary. So I ended up with all of this stuff that people recommended to me and was like, I think you might like this. You should try this. Maybe you should try this trope. And now that it's actually a couple of years on from that, I know that I don't like some of these tropes. So based on now, knowing like I can tell you with 100% certainty that I do not like reverse harem with potentially the exception of novellas. Like I have read two reverse harem novellas that I actually did quite enjoy. One was the Harley LaRue one that goes with, is it The Losers? I can't remember what the novella was called. I don't really want to read The Losers though because I feel like that's too much, like it's too long. I, I feel like I'll lose interest really quickly. And also um, Tangled in Tinsel. It was like a Christmas novella that I really liked. Generally, I don't really like the concept as we went through yesterday. So I, I shouldn't be going out of my way to read stuff that I don't like the concept of. Because like we said with Lola and the Millionaires, even if the book is good, the concept itself is just immediately putting me off and means that overall I don't like it. So in terms of the stacks, I know for sure that I have two reverse harem books in here. And I think now that Lola and the Millionaires is gone, it is just two. But I think, you know what, while we're here, while we're here, we're gonna go upstairs as well and we're gonna look up there because like I said, like I, I, I feel bad because I wanna give all of these books a try, but if I know that like it's not gonna work for me, what's the point? I feel like once we start on this slope though, Reverse Harem is the first to go and Paranormal Romance is gonna go swiftly afterwards. The main one, I'm actually gonna keep one. And I, yeah, there's two here, I am gonna keep one and I will let you know why. The first one, the one that's definitely going is Friends with the Monsters by Albany Walker. I'm pretty sure, yeah, MFMM reverse harem novel with adult themes, not recommended for those under 18. This was actually one of the first fantasy romances. I think somebody, was it Ash? It was Nicole. Oh, Nikki gifted this to me when I was kind of looking for fantasy romance recommendations. So when I had this, when I received this, I did not know what reverse harem was. And now I do, and sadly, 
I know <laughs> that this is not for me. It's covered in fluff though. So this one is definitely hitting my own haul pile. The other one I'm gonna keep, but I will tell you what it is and why I'm gonna keep it. It is Broken Bonds by J. Bree. So this was gifted to me by Ash and Ash also at the same time sent me the crown of oaths and curses by j Bree. this is the one that i'm most interested in this one is they're both fantasy romance high fantasy romance i believe this one is fated mates this one is reverse harem i do believe though that this one is a very very slow burn and i feel like if there's a lot of plot in these books a lot of fantasy plot and the romance itself is slow burn i feel like i won't mind that it's reverse harem not necessarily that i like the romance but i won't mind it whereas if the main like lola and the millionaires is like the, the point the main point is that it's reverse harem i don't think i'll enjoy that and if it's like more smut i want to say because there is a difference i like smutty romance i don't really like smut as a genre like erotica as a genre because i like a little bit more plot so i feel like if it's smart as opposed to romance then i'm also probably definitely not gonna like it so we are gonna be keeping this um i do expect to like the crown of oaths and curses this series a little bit more but i'm also gonna keep this one in case i fall in love with this and i want to read more jay Bree. i love how i made such a big deal about culling the stacks literally that's it that is the only thing that i have in here that's reverse harem we are now down to 64 books in the stacks which i do need to remember for later so i am gonna have a look upstairs and if i do manage to get rid of anything from upstairs i actually could not tell you how much reverse harm i still have up there if any but if we do manage to clear anything off the shelves up here then i'm obviously going to make space and have to do a bit of reorganization anyway i was gonna save this for the end of the episode but i just felt like i didn't want to be in a position where we randomly generated another reverse harem book and then i would have to go through all of this again so i'm actually gonna get my other tripod because these shelves are way too big for me to do this handheld <laughs> so i changed my mind because i actually have more maneuverability if i do this handheld but i think all of these are all fine these ones are all fine i don't think that these are you think they're all not reverse harem <laughs> There is this one, which is Queen Takes Nights by Jolie Sue Burkhart. This one, how long is this one? Because it is a novella. It's less than 200 pages. I'll keep it because like I said, I am partial to or I don't mind a reverse harem novella. I think all of this is fine. I'm not sure about this one, but I don't think that it is. This I've heard is like super light Omega verse, so it definitely contains not in, but I think that's about it. And I'm willing to give it a try because I love Ali Hazelwood so much. Christina Lauren is all fine. These are all fine. Let's have a look down here. I'm pretty sure that at least not all of these are. No, these ones are like revenge or bully romances. This is the Harley LaRue one that I said I actually really like. I love this novella, but mainly because it doesn't start as like a, a group thing, I think is why I like that one. Um, and then down here. If you see anything, by the way, guys, that you think is reverse harem or you know is reverse harem that I'm skipping over, um, do let me know. I don't think that this is. You know what? I think we're good. I think I've managed to get rid of it all. Do I just unhaul this? I might, because while I might enjoy it, I don't really want to read it. So yeah, this one is going to head to my own haul pile. And this actually leaves me a bit of wiggle room, so we'll see what we can do with that. So I've grabbed a few options and we're just going to see. Oh my god. Oh my god. This. This is also reverse harem. <laughs> and I'm going to be unhauling this. Goodbye. I do know that this is going to hurt a lot of you guys as well. I'm sorry. Just remember... Just because you love something and I don't means nothing. It's just it's just personal preference. I don't want to read it. It's fine. <laughs> okay, so these are supposed to be in alphabetical order, but they're not because it just has not worked out that way. But can I fit this one in? Oh, that's perfect. 
there we go. And this saves me from potentially disappointing Aaron once again in this video because this is a book that Aaron gifted to me and said that it was like a really really good fantasy romance with a good fantasy plot. So like I'm still really excited to read it but I, there's no potential now of me reading it in this video and continuing to upset Aaron. <laughs> and these two will go back to the stacks. This book is actually shorter than I thought that it was. I thought that it was over 400 pages but it has an excerpt from The Spear Cuts Through Water in the back so it's actually only 380 86 pages which means that at page 198 I am now over halfway through this one and it has taken me a while to be able to get to a point where I feel like I can tell you what the gist of this story is. I'm only on page 198 uh, on chapter 6 so the chapters in here range from like 30 to 50 pages and they are like a little bit I don't want to say that they're long-winded because it's not that they're irrelevant but each kind of chapter is putting together this small piece of something that is like kind of building up the whole. The main point I would say of this book is that there is a boy who potentially has the ability to do something great that will be very impactful to the future of like space, space travel, science and all of that like big mind bendy stuff. There is a captain of a ship that is assigned to look after this boy keep him outside of the kind of policed areas of space like the the areas of space that are controlled by this big corporation this woman who's like over a thousand years old wants this captain to keep this boy out of allied space so that he can grow up unpoliced and like unwatched and then when the time comes that society is able to study the abilities of this boy this woman would like him bring him back so that is kind of the point but there's so much more about this book than that the woman who's a thousand years old she actually grew up on earth she was the person who created the plans for the space stations that allowed humans to start living in space like on space stations and she has managed to preserve her life for all this time the space captain is somebody who normally does like cargo runs for seeds from one of the planets which we actually start off on one of the planets in the universe that is farming this seed so she typically just trans transports this cargo but one day this boy lands on this planet in like this big fiery inferno but he is fine so when she's going to pick up this shipment of seed the people of this planet kind of give her this boy and say like can you take him back with you because he just crash landed here and we kind of don't know what his deal is and then we do of course also have the boy himself who has very clearly suffered great trauma but for the longest time we don't know the circumstances of how he ended up on this planet where he was before and why he won't talk. So I was definitely right when I said that this is more of a literary sci-fi. It definitely reads like that with the way, I wanna say mainly the way the perspectives are built up. And it also actually reads a little bit like translated fiction, specifically the storytelling style, the way that it reads reminds me a lot of like Japanese translated fiction, which it, it isn't. That's just the vibe I'm kind of getting from it. But I also very much see the comparison between this and the Wayfarer series by Becky Chambers especially because so much of this story, like I said, the point of this story is traveling with this boy outside of allied space. So the majority of the story takes place on this ship with the captain and her crew that are traveling with this boy and they're going to be on this journey for a long period of time. Like these people are being paid a lot of money, but they are doing it at the sacrifice of like many years of their life. And they're also bound by contract as well. So for the entirety of this mission, they cannot abandon the mission. They cannot abandon the boy. They can't change their mind. Like they're locked into this contract for this time. So it is like with the first Becky Chambers book, which is Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. It is more about the relationships and the happenings on this ship during the journey than it is anything else. Something that I really like about this is the world building, which also reminds me a little bit of the Becky Chambers series in that nothing is kind of overly explained in here but the context clues make you very aware of what the things are even though they're concepts that are alien to us. So the tech that they have in here with it being like a thousand plus years in the future is stuff that we don't have but the way that it's described the way that it's used is makes it really clear what it is like what its purpose is like the variation of like mobile phones that they have the variation of social media is obvious 
because of the context in which things are used as opposed to them being described like this is a device that we use to call people and send text messages to make it clear that it's a phone. It's more just like the organic way in which things are used and interacted with makes them really obvious to the reader like what they are even though the concepts are new and like kind of futuristic and I really like that because it creates like a really rich well-developed world with like a really good atmosphere that you can sink into without feeling like you're being talked down to and I do actually love a real good info dump in like a fantasy like if you want to info dump the entire world to me at the beginning of a book I am fine with that but I'm also really into seamless world building like it's present in the vanished birds and I do think that this is really hard to do because there are so many times where I have read books that kind of introduce new concepts um, and don't explain them and it's left me feeling confused and lost and like something's missing whereas in this it's just so clear what the things are even though they're never explained so that's kind of cool i am enjoying this for sure at this point this could be anything between a three and five star because once again like with the becky chambers series this very much feels like it's more about the journey rather than the destination so i'm kind of just along for the ride it's interesting but nothing overly dramatic is happening so it's not like I'm hooked or I'm obsessed or I can't stop turning pages but I am enjoying my time reading it. There is something, taking this back to Japanese fiction which once again this is not, there is something that I find very soothing and very peaceful when I read Japanese translated fiction. It's something about the storytelling style that kind of just really absorbs me but in a way well like I said like I'm not compelled to turn pages, I'm not like excited, I'm not riveted but I am very content with my time reading and I'm getting that same kind of atmosphere from here where like kind of feel at peace when I'm reading which sounds like kind of really deep but it's the best way that I can kind of explain it. I am enjoying the story but I'm not like losing my mind over it you know. So I am about to go for a run. I typically go first thing in the morning but I just wasn't feeling up to it so I've given myself like a couple of hours. <laughs> to kind of work myself up to it. I'm feeling kind of really demotivated and a little bit physically tired this week, but I'm still trying to maintain, you know, like my workout schedule and stuff, which I am doing, but it's just taking me like a little bit longer to gear myself up to it than usual this week. And actually with running, I was never a runner. I never enjoyed running. I never wanted to run. And then I did the Peloton program, which you may have heard me mention, which was to get me from like doing nothing to running for 30 minutes without stopping and I did that and when I was doing that I was excited and enthusiastic about running and since I've done it I don't want to run anymore like I'm still doing peloton runs like I'm still putting on like a 20 or 30 minute workout so I have something to listen to while I'm running I'm just not enthusiastic like I've gone back to the kind of mentality of being like I don't want to go outside and I don't want to run running has been hard <laughs> recently but I did enjoy it, I do kind of enjoy it, so I don't want to stop, especially because I went through the trouble of building up from nothing to running for 30 minutes, like I don't want to lose that ability, but it has been hard to motivate myself to run recently, so I'm gonna go and get it out of the way because I'm feeling more physically tired this week. I'm gonna do 20 minutes instead of 30, which feels like a cop out, but we're not gonna talk about it. <laughs> And then I'm gonna get some editing done. I do have Patreon sprints tonight though, so I'm hoping to get through a good chunk of this. Not promising that I'm gonna finish it, but I feel like I'll be close by the end of the day. Just gonna um, put a rain check on that run. Literally a rain check actually, because I finished filming that clip. I stood up, I looked out the window and it's now raining. So we're gonna wait for that to pass. It's a light rain. It should pass in the next 10, 15 minutes or so, but yeah, that was, I finally, it took me so long to want to run. <laughs> I finally got there and it started raining. This reminds me as well, like I keep saying that I need a jacket to run in and then just not buying one. And I really do need to get on that at some point so that when it does rain, I can just go out anyway. Well, hello there. I have finished my book. I finished The Vanished Birds and I, I'm torn. I have mixed feelings about this one. It is not a five star read for me. So Aaron was wrong but it is i would say a four star read for me but the disconnect between my rating and my feelings on this book is that i thought that the writing was excellent like i loved the way that this was written i also really loved the atmosphere and the tone of the story and the overall themes and messages i didn't become as attached to this book as i feel like i needed to be to truly love this one and i think that 
that is why I'm feeling kind of on the fence about it. So I didn't connect to the characters as much as I wanted to, as much as I kind of felt that I needed to. And in terms of the pacing, I throw the middle of this, like I think around the page 250 to just past the 300 page mark. I was really struggling with motivation to continue on with this story. I was getting kind of bored if I'm being honest and I was kind of just waiting for it to be over until we got to around that page 300 mark when things started to pick up again and the thing that kind of I want to say saved this book for me but the thing that made it a four star as opposed to a three star is I felt like this book kind of lulled me into this false sense of security with its similarity to Becky Chambers and because of that I was kind of expecting this to be more about the messages and the relationships between the crew members and that sense of found family which definitely plays a crucial role in this book but it diverts from kind of the Becky Chambers-esque vibe going on here when it gets a lot more brutal than I expected it to and it takes a very sinister turn in those last like 100 pages that I kind of wasn't expecting from my experience with this book throughout the main body of it. I feel like as well as the messages of like love and found family that are present throughout here. There are big overarching themes of colonialism and capitalism and essentially what's going on in the world now but on a extremely magnified and expanded scale kind of forms the base of the conflict I want to say in this book like the it plays a very crucial role in the things that happened that kind of took this book into a new direction and I really appreciated the examination of that. I think in terms of plot is potentially where this lost me a little bit because it is a book that is more about the themes and the messages than it is about the actual story and I guess for me who doesn't skew towards more literary novels, more introspective novels, I feel like I just needed a little bit more from the story to make this a five star book for me but I think if you really like books like the the Wayfarer series by Becky Chambers if you like more literary skews like more literary perspectives on the speculative fiction that you read then The Vanished Birds will definitely be a good one for you. This does also have strong themes of music throughout if that is something that you like. It's not something that I like gravitate towards but I know that some of you guys will so if that is like a key theme that you enjoy in books then this is definitely like music is a very strong part of this book and I actually really enjoyed seeing it kind of come full circle in that regard and there is also tons of queer representation in here as well. So I don't know at this point whether I'm going to be picking up the spear cuts through water just because I didn't love this the way that I expected it to. In terms of shelf it or scrap it though I do think that this is going to be a shelf for me because this is a thought-provoking novel and I feel like it's going to have the potential or it does have the potential to haunt me a little bit. So I I feel like if I unhaul it it'll be something that at some point I kind of want to come back and reference and I don't have it to hand so yes I am going to be shelving this which means that we're gonna go see where we can squeeze it in and pick something from the shelves which I am a little bit nervous about because right in the I have tons of unread books on my shelves but right in the middle of my paperback shelves is kind of where I've read the most from so we have less choice than we do in like other areas especially like if we're going to the hardbacks but yeah I liked this one I really did I think it's thought provoking I feel like it's moving it just I just needed like just something a little bit more for this to be five stars it's actually really funny because the mood that I'm in when I'm filming these videos very much depends on the decision making process that kind of happens when we get here like when we get to the shelves and what I decide to do with stuff and as I have expressed in this vlog like over the last week or so it's it's a hormonal week for me let's just leave it at that but because of that I'm feeling quite run down quite demotivated my temper is short my patience is non-existent and so that is very much going to influence the decision <laughs> that I make when I'm shelving this so let's see let's see what we've got so it's a J we're alphabetical we are looking at here between the last beginning by Lauren James and Beneath the Keep by Erica Johansson is kind of where this book needs to be. So we're looking at this shelf, but obviously we have wiggle room around. I'm going to see if I can move you guys in a little bit. So for this shelf in terms of what I have and I have not read, these two are unread. This one I read for 
the first episode of this challenge and I really liked it. Um, these two are unread. Grady Hendrix is an author that I really enjoy. Christina Henry is an author that I don't enjoy. So this is potential for something. I'll leave this one hanging out. I've read The Devouring Brain, The Deck of Omens, Robin Hobb. I have not read this trilogy, but The Realm of the Eldlings is one of my favorite series of all time. This one is a book that I read when I was a kid and I loved and I really want to reread it. This one is a hard hitting contemporary. I've read The Shadow of What Was Lost. I have not read these. So actually, I haven't read most of the books on this shelf. Um, Beneath the Keep is a prequel to The Queen of the Tealin. I love The Queen of the Tealin. Have not read this. It was published quite an amount of time afterwards. So based on, I mean, I've left this pulled out, but this could be a contender or something to read. I feel like I'm potentially too old to properly enjoy this now, so that could be a contender. It doesn't really make sense to me in terms of the challenge for me to like start reading Robin Hobb because I'm probably gonna keep it and then we'll just be back in the shelves, you know? Like we won't shelve efficiently. But like I said, my mood is playing a big part in what's going on here. So I actually think I'm just going to unhaul The Lost Boy by Christina Henry without reading it, which means that we should hopefully just be able to slot the vanished birds in right here. Let me walk you through this. I have read the first two Alice books by Christina Henry and I've also read the Little Red Riding Hood book that she wrote. So the Alice ones I really didn't like. I didn't like the type of horror that they were. I thought they were kind of boring. The Red Riding Hood one I did enjoy to a point but I thought it was almost like she just could not be bothered <laughs> to write the end of that book and it ended like super abruptly and made the whole thing kind of pointless. So at the time that I read that I was once again like holding this up like should I unhaul this because I haven't enjoyed really anything by Christina Henry and I had a reasonably good time reading the Red Riding Hood one until the ending was just terrible and I have actually heard really good things about The Lost Boy so I was like I'm gonna keep this around I don't anticipate keeping it but I would like to give it a read and that's kind of where we left it at this point now if I am faced with the decision of reading this book just to unhaul it I actually would rather just just not bother reading it I don't want to read it I'm at a point now where especially because at the minute I'm craving like really gritty like fantasy that I can really sink my teeth into that's kind of the general reading mood that I'm in and I am actually reading one of those books on the side of filming this vlog so don't worry about that but um I'm just really craving books that are going to be deeply meaningful to me that I'm going to get really invested in and a kind of throwaway horror that's going to be fine while I'm reading it that I'm probably just gonna unhaul after I've read it. It's just not, it's not the vibe, you know? So that one is being scrapped, which means to pick our next book, we have to once again head to the stacks. I hope you guys are enjoying how ruthlessly I'm just unhauling things <laughs> in this episode. It's actually quite refreshing as somebody who is cripplingly indecisive, just like in general, to when I'm in this mood confidently, just be able to say like, no, I'm not gonna enjoy this. No, I'm not gonna read it. I don't want to read it. Even if I was to enjoy it, I still don't don't want to read it so I'm unhauling it like it feels real good but on the flip side of that we are potentially going to see a downside of this right now because I just have a feeling that no matter what we generate from the stacks right now I'm not going to be happy about it so we're doing really well actually we have 63 books left in the stack so so far we have removed five during this episode and then we have all of the stuff that I've unhauled off the shelves as well so our max is 63 and book four for this vlog will be number 51. So it's like, I'm gonna anticipate it's like at the bottom of this stack. So potentially a hardback, 51, 45, take you down a little bit. 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by Megan Bannon. So I think that this is one of the early adult fairy loot books. It is from July, 2022. So yeah, it was only like the fourth or fifth one that they did. And I believe from my memory that this is a fantasy romance, but with a very historical lean to it. I also think it leans heavily on the romance side of the scale and has less fantasy. Like it doesn't have a epic fantasy plot or anything like that as far as I'm aware. And I think it has like a you've got male twist to it. It's following Hart who is a marshal tasked with patrolling the magical wilds of Tanria and Mercy is an under 
Undertaker. So I don't think that they like each other, but Hart pens a letter addressed to a friend and then he gets like an anonymous response back and it's from Mercy. So those two obviously end up growing closer throughout this. This could go either way for me. I, I truly don't know if I'm going to enjoy this. It's compared to the house in the Cerulean Sea, which I like. One of the blurbs here from Helen Huang compares it to Hell's Moving Castle. I, I don't know. So I guess we're gonna find out. I feel like it's gonna be quite like a fun, faster paced one. I do feel though, like this is just an, an assumption. So don't take it like too heavily, but I feel like this is going to be similar to like Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, which is a book that I did enjoy, but it hasn't left a lasting impression on me. It was like a good time when I read it and I just couldn't care less about it, like in hindsight. I feel like it's gonna be that kind of book, which isn't super motivating, but we'll find out. It's it's 414 pages, so it is pretty average sized. I really love little Polaroids in the end pages on this. And I don't think I've heard anybody like super enthusiastic about this, but I haven't heard anything super negative about it either. So I guess I'll let you know how I'm getting along with it when I've made it a little bit of the way through. I am 150 pages into the undertaking of Heart and Mercy and I am confused. Confused and conflicted would be the best way to describe my time with this book so far. I really thought going into this that it was going to be historical and purely based on assumption, I wanna say from the cover design and also very specifically because Mercy is an undertaker, I thought that this was gonna have a Victorian lean to it. I don't know why. I, I, is there something particularly Victorian about Undertakers? Like Undertakers have always existed in some, like even if they're not called Undertakers, some form of Undertaker has literally always existed and still exists today. So I don't know why, maybe it was that in combination with the cover design that made me feel like this was gonna be Victorian, but it is absolutely not. And it is also kind of not historical, but also kind of historical. <laughs> the same time. The best way that I could describe it is that it kind of leans Wild West, but also the main character, like Mercy wears like high tops, so essentially Converse and sundresses. Sometimes she wears like overalls and head bandanas and sneakers, but it's very modern. The way the characters interact with each other is very modern. The society is very modern. They have like bakeries, they eat donuts, and the juxtaposition of that with this Wild West frontier kind of setting where there's no technology really. They, the only real electronic item that I feel has been mentioned in here is like a gramophone. They also have cars, but they call them auto ducks. I don't know why they call them ducks. And this is where the conflict is coming in because I really like the writing and the way this is written. I really like the tone of the story. Um, because it's quite funny. I like, there's, there's like swearing in here, which I do feel works really well with, especially with the character of Hart, because he's a marshal who is essentially somebody who goes out into the Wild West kind of area, which is actually this fantasy area. And kill zombies that are called drudges. So I like that and I like the characters. I just can't put the two things together in my head. And it is reminding me a little bit of Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross, which we all know is a book that I think is wildly overrated because I feel like it is a wartime romance that is trying to be a fantasy for the sake of it, but the fantasy is like not well executed at all. This feels very much like that. I would say that the fantasy element is done better in here. It is a more present part of the story. Also of a very obvious comparison to Divine Rivals is that the two main characters in here are also trading letters, but they don't know like who they're talking to. And it's some mystical force that's connected the two of them. Obviously that's the You've Got Mail influence on both of them, but the way that they're both romances at the forefront and fantasy in the background is really making me feel similarly to 
towards this as I did to Divine Rivals. Although I do feel like the fantasy is better executed in here because it isn't the forefront of the story. While we are getting these little bits of world building, like I feel it's not coming together in my mind. Like I, I always say that like the best books for me are ones that I can play like a movie in my mind and I cannot get a grasp on this because I just don't understand how the setting and the characters fit together because I can't place this in a time period. Like I don't know how to build the pictures in my mind because I'm not getting enough from the world building to truly understand like how this world has came about and, and what the deal is, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I am struggling with it in that regard because I feel like I'm having to really concentrate on reading it because the bit of your mind that you know like kind of feels like if you know that a book is Victorian you can kind of fill in some Victorian blanks as you're reading and you have a backdrop to set that story on. I have no backdrop here so it feels like I'm working really hard to fill in those blanks but being unable to because I don't understand <laughs> the world building. I do know that this is potentially a me problem like a lot of people can kind of just let it go it's not that serious they can follow the story and not think too hard about the world building but I do think it is because I am such a visual reader that I need that like I need that backdrop to be able to immerse myself in the story and really focus on the story. Um, in terms of the chemistry between them, I'm not really feeling it. I'm enjoying them as separate characters with their own separate backstories, which they, they do have. Like, Mercy is keeping her family's business afloat. Her father has had a heart attack. Um, her brother has just come home because the company, the undertaking company that she's essentially running is called Birds All and Son. And the son's just come home and decided that he doesn't want to be an undertaker anymore, which Mercy is devastated by because she's kind of just been shoring up this business ready for him to take over. And it turns out that, that he's not going to do that. So there's her, her two siblings and her father and just the way they operate as a family as well as this like business struggle that they kind of have going on in the background. And Mercy is also keeping secrets for all of her family members and is struggling <laughs> to be able to do that when all of their secrets kind of impact the other, but she's sworn that she won't tell anyone. And then we have Hart, who is, what are they called? They're like, no, I've took the dust jacket off. They're like marshals of the, I can't remember if it's like the wilds or the frontier, but essentially there's like a portal in this town. This is a border town, so it borders this magical realm that has something to do with old gods. So the new gods killed the old gods, I think, very like ancient Greece. And there's these portals that enter into this world and there are drudges. The drudges are essentially zombies. So they are decaying and they will attack people when their body decays so much that they need to find a new host. Now, something else about this world is that the soul is located in the appendix so to kill the drudges you have to stab them in the appendix to release the soul and when they do start to decay they will attack humans to transfer their soul into some like a fresh appendix it's interesting and it's different i just for me don't feel like it's explained enough for me to really like get a grasp on it hart is a marshal he doesn't have a partner he lost his mentor a long time ago and he's never really recovered from it or dealt with his grief his dog also died he loves dogs but he just can't bring himself to get a new one he's fallen out with past friends because of the arguments that they've had relating to his reluctance to kind of really move on and build connections with people essentially because he's scared of loss and eventually his superior who used to be his best friend assigns him an apprentice and he kind of reluctantly has to train this guy to be a marshal and learn to be around people again I guess. He is very closed off but mainly due to loss that he's experienced and the way that the do you want to chill? <laughs> The way that the this system works in terms of like the drudges is that because they were people originally that have turned into drudges, when a marshal kills them, they bring them back to an undertaker to like perform the burial rites. So Heart and Mercy hate each other essentially because they got off on the wrong foot on their first meeting. The drudges, or I guess everybody in this world, has a prepaid funeral package with an undertaker. So Heart has no choice but to deliver bodies to Mercy if the funeral package that that person, that drudge took out when they were a human links back to Mercy's funeral home. So yeah, they essentially just got off on the wrong foot and have disliked each other because of that. I don't love that because when the dislike is so obviously built on miscommunication and something like super insignificant, like it's not tension. They don't have like the, the, the fiery passion that creates like a really good hate to love story in my opinion. They're just basing all of this resentment on something that happened 
such a long time ago off something so inconsequential that when they're fighting it kind of feels like they're just being mean to each other for the sake of it so like there's elements of it that i'm liking i like the quirkiness and the tone and the writing i'm struggling with the world building the chemistry isn't 100 there for me right now so it's very much like a mixed bag and i just have no idea how i'm gonna feel by the end of it i do feel like that i've reached a real turning point in this story so i feel like we're gonna see where things go from this point on because from now it could potentially turn into an entirely different story and I could see a little bit more of that chemistry come in which I guess is what I'm hoping for but it is a weird one because I'm enjoying my time reading it but also like I'm struggling with it at the same time. I am nearly done with this book so I'm going to be bringing you my full thoughts soon. I'm having a Saturday morning in bed trying to get through the end of it because I'm so excited to finish it. Essentially I feel very differently about it right now than I did the last time I checked in. I am loving this. The world building, I still don't completely get it, especially because now I've kind of figured out that the horses have webbed feet, which implies that they are very water-based. But based on the actual text of the book, they're not overly water-based. Like sometimes there's water, sometimes there's not like, you know, in the normal world. And it's the same for the cars. I think they're called auto ducks because something to do with water, but I never, like it never explicitly states that they're driving on water. It doesn't say that this land is covered in canals or rivers and that's what they drive on. So I, I still don't get the world building, but I love the romance. I love the tone. I love the writing. I love the atmosphere and I'm having a really good time. I'm on page 337. So I have 80, 78 pages left and then I'll let y'all know what I think of the end. I loved this book. I really did. And I feel like it was so unexpected. It was really the second half that sold this book for me because after the first 200 pages, like I felt like this could have started to wrap up. We did have a little bit of a fantasy plot line in here that I did think actually was decently executed, even though I didn't think it was 100% necessary because I was going into this knowing that the main plot at the forefront of this story was gonna be the romance. But at the 200 page mark, I felt like we kept building to a point where the romance in here could kind of resolve and go into a happily ever after. And we could maybe wrap up this book before the page 300 mark. However, I'm so glad that we didn't because it's after that page 200 mark that I really fell in love with the story. I ended up giving it a high four star because I feel like with my still very shaky grasp on the world building, I still don't understand why everything in this world is about water, even though the world is not underwater and there is not any more water in this world, <laughs> as far as I can tell, than any other world, like than, than our world. But I fell in love with the characters. In terms of the, in terms of Mercy, I actually genuinely really liked her. I thought that she was fun to follow and norm not normally, but very frequently, I can get kind of frustrated and annoyed by the heroines of romance novels. And I actually really loved Mercy. But in terms of heart, our love interest, I, I've said this before, but I love a love interest that does not know his worth. It's the same as Gideon in The Crimson Moth, like a man who feels like he's not good enough, even though like genuinely, like everybody around them thinks that they're a stand up guy. And we definitely had that in terms of heart in this book, which I love like that. I'm always sold when we have a hero that does not know his worth. So that was what made me really get behind heart in here. In the middle portion of this book, we had a solid chunk that was dedicated to the romance. But aside from that, while this book is very much romantically inclined, we had a lot of personal development and character growth on behalf of our main characters that kind of happened separately. We had the family dynamic with Mercy and her kind of like evolution within her family, the roles within her family and her having looked after them for such a long time, being I think the eldest, kind of finally standing up for herself and declaring like what she actually wanted for herself. And then Hart on the other side, really dealing with some of these demons that he's been wrestling for such a long time. And then, like I said, we did have a fantasy plot line in there as well. So the only thing that I can really fault in this book is the world building. Maybe it is a type too long. I ended up enjoying it as a full package. Maybe the first 200 pages didn't need to be 200 pages, but aside from that, it is only the <laughs> slight confusion I have on behalf of the world building. I kind of, in the end, settled on it being like a like frontier town, like a, a wild west desert kind of 
environment. Time period wise, the, the confusing thing to me is that I just really like to make sense of things and some things just you don't you're not supposed to make sense of you're not supposed to think about that hard you're kind of just supposed to roll with it but we had like no electricity in this place we have like like the transistor is hand cranked we have gramophones the lamps are gas lamps but then cars or auto ducts have headlamps but nobody like specifies how they work so it's just stuff like that that kind of threw me a little bit because I do really like well thought out worlds like world building one of my favorite things in a story so that is the only reason that I didn't give this five stars however headed into the sequels of this book which I'm going to order the fairy loot edition of the undermining of Twyla and Frank I think it is which they do still have in stock in the fairy trove which is amazing news I think going in knowing a little bit about the world and knowing not to think about it too hard there is potential for books like later books in this series to be five stars for me as I'm pretty sure you can tell we are going to be shelving the undertaking of heart and mercy which i am very happy to do i've just scratched the spread edge which is very annoying but yeah let's see this is predominantly a romance so it's going to be on my romance shelves which is why i'm upstairs and i know that i don't have room for it so let's see what we're going to move so the angle on these shelves is notoriously terrible especially when we're talking about this top hardback shelf but as i did downstairs i will run through what we have here so heartbones by colleen hoover i have not read it ends with us five star book it starts with us unnecessary sequel i have read it i'll keep them because they're a set but like not overly attached um loved you again by kate goldbeck i have not read the reunion or this spells love dane dr dill loved x hex loved sequel gave two stars to but i am as of right now clinging onto this for pretty much no reason other than it goes with the X-Hex. Um, this one is the US first printing that I picked up in New York, but then I got this so that these two editions of Fourth Wing and Iron Flame would match. These ones are the Waterstones. And then I also have my favorite contemporary romance ever in the Fairy Loot edition. And I'm wondering now, this would fit on a regular shelf if I wanted to unhaul or like read a paperback because it's kind of annoying that this is slightly shorter than the rest of the hardbacks and also this is not going back in there we go I feel like a sensible thing to do here would be to get rid of this because I truly am not attached to it at all I want to keep I, I could unhaul the xx if I'm being honest I just it's a five star read and I'd like to keep hold of five star reads as much as possible but the kiss curse I didn't even like it so I don't need it do I so we could just haul this however this is quite a bit thinner than the undertaking of heart and mercy so i'm not even sure if this is going to work it is going to go right on the end let's see what we can do can i do it oh there's going to be some overhang here i've done it i mean it's not great <laughs> I do need to find some other solution for romance hardbacks than this. I actually can, if you guys see, like there is a little bit of space here and over on this other side, I could fit another one of these in if I went to Ikea and got one. So I think I might do that. It's just, I haven't been reading the most romance recently, so I don't really want to expand my romance collection. And obviously while I want some more space up here for hardbacks, I don't want more space for paperbacks just for the sake of having more space for hardbacks. You know, that seems like a weird kind of solution. But anyway, we are going to be unhauling a two star read for me, which is The Kiss Curse, to get The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy on the shelves. And on that note, actually, I feel like it's about time that we had a little bit of a look at what we've achieved during this vlog and wrap up this episode of Shelve It or Scrap It. But I'm gonna have to rack my memory because I have not been keeping note of all of the things that we've rearranged and reshelved and unhauled during this one. <laughs> So I am really impressed with our progress in this episode because in total over episode six, we read or attempted to read four books. And of these four books, we shelved two of them and we managed to scrap two of them. So that ain't bad just to start us off. But on top of that, we did manage to shelve an extra book from the stacks. And from the shelves and the stacks, we managed to scrap an extra five books. So in total, we started this episode on 68 books in the stacks. We have managed to whittle that down to 62 as of right now. And then we have cleared some space in general by scrapping seven 
books. I don't feel like we've had an episode this successful since, was it episode three that went really well? And then in terms of shelving, we have managed to shelve three books in total. We have read a book that Aaron really wanted me to read so she can stop trying to make me read it now. And also I found potentially a new favourite because I know that this wasn't the perfect book. This wasn't five stars, but I do, I really have a place in my heart for this. And actually I just want to add, the time for reviews is over, but this had a depiction of grief that really touched me. And I know that in the synopsis it says the house in the Cerulea Sea meets You've Got Mail, but I think that this for me in terms of TJ Klum reminded me a little bit more of the house in No, Under the Whispering Door. And I really loved that moment at the end. I felt like I'm just going into full review more now because I literally just forgot to add this. The little bit at the end I didn't think was necessary to this story. I feel like we could have completed this story without it. But touching upon that element of grief and the way that it was done um, really did actually get me quite emotional. So yeah, I have a very, very special place in my heart for this book, even though it wasn't a favourite book. So yeah, this is a very successful episode and I am very very happy with our progress in this one. So if y'all are interested in when episode 7 of, I can't believe we're on episode 7 already, of Shelf It or Scrap It is going to be hitting your subscription feed, I am pretty sure that it should be pretty much exactly around the same time of the month that you're getting this episode. And if y'all are interested in vlogs in general, the next one is going to be a standard weekly reading vlog. It is one week until I'm going to San Diego Comic Con so I have a lot to do. And and also I have a massive stack of library books currently out from the library but three of those I have to return before I go on holiday because they all have holds on them. So that's what I'm going to be trying to get through in my next vlog. Do stay tuned if that's something you are interested in but I do hope that you guys have enjoyed this one if you've made it this far. If you have please don't forget to like if you liked it and subscribe if you wanna and I'll see you guys next week. Bye! Oh you bite your friend like chocolate you say you're a go where nobody knows With guns hidden under our petticoats We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no